I'm Charles Wilson, Cybersecurity Engineering Technical Fellow at Motional, responsible for cybersecurity development lifecycle practice. This presentation will cover the AVCDL's Cybersecurity Requirements Taxonomy. This diagram shows the overall AVCDL training path. If you're taking this training, it's assumed that you've already completed the AVCDL overview training. This training covers the taxonomy of cybersecurity requirements. The state of cybersecurity requirements today is pretty hit or miss. Sometimes it hits the target, but usually we're hard pressed to get close to the mark. It's really inconsistent. What we've ended up with is a huge pile of very specific requirements that are not attached to the functional requirements, but rather simply have been added to the list of functional requirements. Keep in mind that cybersecurity requirements are non-functional. They're meant to constrain the functional requirements. Because of that, they're not going to be constructed in the same way. What we'd like to have is a catalog, a library, if you will, of cybersecurity requirements that we can pick and choose from and attach to the functional requirements. We also need to have them organized in a far more systematic fashion than we've had in the past. In order to achieve that goal, let's start by reviewing the fundamentals of what we're asking of the requirements and where they need to be applied. Let's start by talking about cybersecurity control points. Here we have two entities, A and B. They represent arbitrary entities which communicate, store, and process cybersecurity relevant data. Let's consider where we would apply cybersecurity controls. The first place is the data channel, where we apply controls to address data in motion. We think about these things all the time when we talk about TLS or FTPS or other security-oriented protocols. The second place of control that we have is for data storage. This is data at rest. Here we're thinking about controls applied either through an access control list type system or using mechanisms such as cryptography. Finally, we're going to address data in use. That's when you have sensitive information that's being processed. How do you address that? When we bring these three together, we can see that we're covering the lifetime of the data. Now let's look in more detail at the asset classes that fall into these three categories. Let's enumerate the asset classes for the different states that we have for data at rest, data in motion, and data in use. Our first class within data at rest is executables. That is, any binary data which may run in the system. This includes software and firmware. Basically, anything which has a binary representation which can be interpreted as a set of instructions for the system. Next is configuration data. This is the data used to establish the personality of a system. One can consider this metadata that gives personality to the executables. The next is structured data or databases. This is data in a structured format and it's typically managed by specialized database engines. Next, we have unstructured data. This is any data store not handled as a database, so binary data files fall into this class, as do plain text files. System credentials are something we consider specifically because of their cybersecurity relevance and sensitivity. This data is intended to be used to establish and maintain the identity of an entity. Finally, we have log files. This data is used to record system events specifically, and here we're referring to either a data log or an audit log. We tend to care more about audit logs within the realm of cybersecurity 
because of the sensitivity of the data that they contain. For data in motion, we're going to think about either PII, that is personally identifiable information because of its intrinsic sensitivity, and also, more generally, packets themselves. These are the data units being used to carry messages with data in transit. Finally, for data in use, we're going to consider computer memory. Here, we have data actively available within the executing system. Now let's take a look at cybersecurity properties. These are the characteristics of assets that we wish to ensure are maintained. We can't talk about cybersecurity properties without bringing up the CIA. This triad of properties has existed for a very, very long time. It's comprised of the properties of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Now, although the CIA tends to be held up as the gold standard, it's not and never has been universally accepted as the only basis for cybersecurity properties. Let's take a quick look at a timeline that shows this. When people talk about the CIA and want to mention where it comes from, they point to a document that was written by Salter and Schroeder in 1975 entitled, The Protection of Information in Computer Systems. Now, this is by no means the first time that anyone had spoken about the properties of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. We can go all the way back through documents that you see here by Conway, Maxwell, and Morgan in 1971, and back further to document written by Ware in 1967. And then finally to a document entitled, on Distributed Communication, Security, Secrecy, and Tamper-Free Considerations by Barron in 1964, a full 11 years before the Salzer and Schroeder paper. Throughout this period, there's a conversation going on as to what these properties mean and what they're for. But by the time that we get to 1975, we've more or less settled on these three properties. Now, in 1983, when the Department of Defense released the Trusted Computer Systems Evaluation Criteria, known as the Orange Book, they didn't think it was significant to put a reference to the CIA model. And that makes you wonder. And it's not until 2002 that the definitions for CIA show up in the United States Federal Register. And from the Salzer and Schroeder paper in 75 until we get to the seminal Microsoft Security Development Lifecycle book in 2006, a number of sources, including Parker or Firesmith or Jurgens or Mead and Hugh, bring up that the CIA model itself is not sufficient to represent all the cybersecurity properties we need to consider. And even the Microsoft SDL introduces Stride as an alternative to use instead of the CIA as the property set. Now, I'm not going to cover Stride in this document or why I don't think it's a good replacement for the CIA. That discussion will be covered in the threat modeling training material. It's important to appreciate that even after Microsoft's SDL and the introduction of Stride, the conversation on replacing the CIA or extending the CIA continued. And in 2007, with Calderon and Marta, we see a discussion of a possible taxonomy of security requirements. And as late as 2019, with use paper, distributed immutable ephemeral, new paradigm for the next era of security, we see that the conversation has continued. Now, 
two documents that I think are worth looking at in the context of extending the CIA are going to be the 1984 ISO OSI document, also released as X.800, and the 2001 NIST SP 800-33. Now, SP 800-33 entitled Underlying Technical Models for Information Technology Security gives us probably our best insight into what an extended set of properties might be. So let's look at that now. So here's the model for security services that NIST developed in SP 800-33. We have the user on the left, and the user can be a process or a person. On the right, we have the resource of interest. Between the two are a bunch of activities that mediate the interaction between the user and the resource. If we think about this in the context of the CIA, for confidentiality, we have the activity at the top labeled transaction privacy. For integrity, we have in the lower right proof of wholeness. And finally, fair availability, we could map that to the access control enforcement to make sure that you can actually get at the thing you want to get at. But even after we do that, we have activities shown here not covered by the CIA, but considered necessary. We've got non-repudiation, so that actions that happen are attested to. We have authorization. We have authentication. We have an audit so that you can go back and see what actually happened. Additionally, there are two activities which are sort of supervisory. One is to restore the secure state, and the other is intrusion detection. Those are less property and more control aspects of the system. So now let's take a look and consider how these services can inform a larger set of cybersecurity properties. Returning again to our CIA triad, the question becomes, is this the best way to think about these three cybersecurity properties and how they relate to each other? Although it's true that you could argue that they're orthogonal to each other, we can create a different representation of them. In this representation, we still have data at the center of everything, but now the properties are nested. Fundamentally, if you can't get at the data, then nothing matters beyond that. And if the data doesn't have integrity, even if we can access it, it's useless. And finally, we have confidentiality. If we have known good data, but can't keep others from seeing it, potentially we have a problem. So let's assume that we can use this as a workable model. Now let's take those properties that we talked about from NIST SP 800-33 which are referred to as the extended CIA in UN R155, and see how they can extend the model. So here's our extended CIA model using the terminology of UN R155. I've shown them here as a set of concentric rings that constrain the CIA, with each new layer being dependent upon the previous. Now let's look at each of these properties and give them formal definitions. Here are the cybersecurity properties. You'll note that these are listed in the order provided by UNR 155 and not the order shown in the model. <coughs> 
when we pull them all together, there are seven of them. Confidentiality, i.e. disclosure of information. Integrity, which is data accuracy and completeness. Availability, the ability to have on-demand access to a resource. Non-repudiation, or the denial of action taken or failure to acknowledge request. Basically, you have to acknowledge that you did what you did. Authenticity, being that the entity has an identity. Accountability or audit, which is the system state history. And finally, authorization, an entity's intrinsic privilege state. All of this theory is wonderful, but let's bring it down to something more concrete. Let's develop a resource access model that we'll be using. Here we have our base model. We have a requester, a resource owner, and a resource. A request comes in, the resource owner manages it, accesses the resource, and returns information to the requester. In a more sophisticated system, we log what's happening. Since we're dealing with activities which are cybersecurity relevant, we want to be able to log events for audit purposes. When we overlay this with a rough model of communications, what we see is that we have a request that comes in. This request decomposes as a source, a destination, a payload, and some kind of integrity check. The payload represents a command with optional data. And the command may represent either a read accessing the data or a write setting it. The data coming back from that activity is a status with optionally data representing the value of the read. That data represents a payload in a response, which, like the request, contains a source and a destination and an integrity check. If we apply a CIA cybersecurity property set to this model, we see that we're only considering the integrity check in terms of integrity, the data in terms of confidentiality, and the channel in terms of availability. However, if we include the additional properties from the extended CIA property set, we see that the additional touch points into the data combined with the controls that we can discreetly apply become far more interesting and significant. So when we combine the concepts of cybersecurity property and asset, what we end up with is a much more sophisticated basis to use when creating cybersecurity requirements. Now, there have been systems proposed which do this, right? defining requirements in terms of properties and assets. Unfortunately, this still leaves a gap. So let's look at an example of that gap and then discuss how to address it. At first blush, the combination of cybersecurity property and asset class seems to be sufficient to be able to dispense requirements. However, there's a problem I've seen manifest while dealing with real-world scenarios, tracking down issues in a fairly sophisticated system, which used a combination of over-the-air communications, internal Ethernet communications, and multiple processes. Now, rather than go into that fairly complex situation, let's talk about a simple one which illustrates the same problem. First, we'll start with the base communications case where we just want to send a message from a source to a destination. We can see that here. We have a message, and we're going to call the contents of the message a command. It's going to go from the source to the destination. Now, we would think 
that, all right, regardless of what the source is, what the destination is, what the channel is, we could look and say, here's what the asset that we're dealing with is, and here's what the cybersecurity properties are, but let's expand it some more. That message may have data associated with it. And we might have a more sophisticated communication where the message has an integrity check for the data. Now, this is a good thing. But let's say that the source and the destination aren't, as would be easiest to talk about here, just going from one process to another. What if we have to include a communications channel and we're going to use a protocol over that channel? Now we have to talk about the fact that in addition to our original source and our original destination, that we have the source and destination of the communications channel. And in all likelihood, we're going to have an integrity check for that. But it's also not unlikely that our message wrapped in protocol A is going to be contained in and sent via another channel, and it's going to have a wrapper, which is protocol B. And that may have an integrity check on it. Now, each time we add intermediation between the original source and destination, we create opportunity for multiple problems. Were we to only consider the end-to-end -end aspect, we might have a cybersecurity requirement regarding integrity, giving us a false sense of security. In reality, each of the source and destination pairs can and should be considered separately. And if we were to threat model this, we could say, yes, between the final source and final destination, we have an integrity check, but we also need to have one at the intermediary layers. So there's this intrinsic concept of layering going on here where we might want to apply different types of security to each layer. And if we don't recognize that up front, we're going to miss the opportunity to be specific about where we apply our controls. Additionally, when we go to use threat modeling in order to assess the design to make sure that the controls are in place, the threat modeling tool will miss these things because they will be masked by this layering. With this example as a backdrop, let's examine the layers we'll need. In an effort to make things as simple as possible, but no simpler, we're going to only have four layers that we consider within the model for our taxonomy. The first one, the physical layer, represents the hardware. The next layer is the network layer. It consists of all the system-mediated transports, things like HTTP, FTP, and PTP. Basically, these are protocols which have predefined interfaces which can't be changed by developers. And so their security is as is. Next, we have the protocol layer. The protocol layer represents all the custom data transports. That is, any transport protocol which is created and controlled by the organization and allows them to manipulate such things as whether or not there's data integrity, whether or not there are sequence numbers, whether or not parts of the data are encrypted, things which are under the control of the organization. Finally, we have the application layer. Here we're dealing with processes within executables which are manipulating the data. These are our endpoints, if you will, as discussed in the previous example. So here's what the completed taxonomy space looks like. We've got the cybersecurity properties on one axis, the assets on another, and the layers on the third. Now, it's all well and good that we have a taxonomy space. 
What do we do with it? How do we populate it? How do we use it? Let's answer these questions. With the taxonomy space established, let's look at how we use it to identify requirement needs. We're going to look layer by layer and consider for each combination of cybersecurity property and asset whether we want to make assertions about that particular combination. The advantage that we have in this particular decomposition, having the extended CIA as properties on the left hand side and the assets across the top and going layer by layer, is that we can both fully consider each asset class in the context of cybersecurity properties and how they're applied. That is, each of the four layers is typically worked on by a different specialized developer applying distinct controls. Let's start with the application layer. For executables, the case can be made for requirements across all seven cybersecurity properties. Similarly, for configuration data, we can cover six of them, and so on until we get to memory where we're only able to establish that there are requirements that can be asserted for confidentiality and integrity. It's important to remember when creating requirements that they need to be represented in a way that ensures that each is unique, simple, testable, and unambiguous. In doing so, you'll be able to create a mapping between individual requirements and tests to verify their implementation. We'll get more into that in the requirements training. The next layer in the sequence is protocols. But we found after completing requirements identification that the protocol and the network assertion locations were the same, which is why they're shown together here. It's important to note that they were not identical in terms of actual number and specific requirements, but that the property asset mapping was the same. Finally, there's the physical layer. Here we added a hardware column. This is because hardware has nothing to do with data at rest in motion or in use per se, but it is a placeholder allowing us to make assertions, specific requirements, if you will, dealing with the hardware itself. All of the requirements that were established using this taxonomy have been provided in a spreadsheet in the AVCDL repo for review. In that document, you can see how the decomposition of the requirements has been done and what the specific requirements are. An interesting thing about the taxonomy is the way that it reflects into various use cases. For instance, if we look at how risk views the space, it tends to look at it from the classic property asset combination. Because where in the layers the issue occurs is not really relevant. You tend to think in combination of, for instance, there is an availability issue with the credentials. That doesn't require us to think about the layer at all in order to make a judgment. Similarly, when you think about the development use case, developers are concerned with the combination of asset and layer because what they're doing is applying a requirement. And they need to know where within the layered construct of the system the cybersecurity control needs to be applied and what asset it needs to be applied to. The fact that it entails a cybersecurity property isn't really relevant because the requirement tells them what it is they need to be constraining.
Finally, let's consider verification. Verification thinks about attempting to either confirm or subvert a cybersecurity property. They're going to do so at a particular layer within the structure. What they manipulate is not really specific to or contingent upon the asset per se. It may involve it, but it's not as important as, say, looking at all of the authentication issues that occur at the application level. Hopefully this gives a good overview of how the AVCDL's Cybersecurity Requirements Taxonomy came about and what its structure is. Some takeaways are that the decomposition really matters. It's the combination of asset, property, and layer, and the specific subdivisions existing within each of those that really makes the taxonomy work. Next is that the decomposition maps to reality. The various proposals that have existed over time were all well and fine, but what really matters is whether or not the application of the requirements in the context of the taxonomy actually maps to reality without gaps. Finally, it's important that whether or not you're using the requirement set provided in the AVCDL repo, that the requirements that you're using be chosen with intent and not simply built up from someone else's list of things or treated as functional requirements instead of non-functional requirements that they actually are. All AVCDL materials, both in source and distribution form, are available on our GitHub site, as shown here. Because of the size of the repository, it's recommended that you either clone the repository or download a zip archive of it if you're not familiar with using Git. Instructions for downloading a zip archive are linked to on the repository's front page. With this training complete, you can proceed to the security requirements training. Here are references to the source material used in the creation of this presentation. They'll also be included in the video description. Additionally, this presentation source material will be provided on the AVCDL GitHub repository.